Hi everyone, uh, sitting inside my car for alternate side parking in Brooklyn, thinking about how I'm going to explain orthogonal linear contrast to you. So let's do that. We're gonna head over to R in a short period of time. I'm about to go back in because it's, I didn't get a ticket yet, so it looks like I'm good. I made a little graph we're gonna look at to explain some of the basic ideas, but just as an overview, the regular ANOVA gives us one value that says you know, that there could be some differences in our group means, but it doesn't tell us what the group differences are. With orthogonal contrasts, we can take a look at specific patterns that could be the differences between the means and evaluate those in terms of the null hypothesis. So let's jump over to R and check that out. Okay, back from the car, we're talking about land orthogonal linear contrasts, and in chapter 12, that's under the general definition of orthogonal comparisons. So I'm hoping to give you another way of thinking about the question, what is a contrast? While I was waiting in the car, I drew this figure that I hope is explanatory. We're gonna step through this and do a little bit of R to help us understand linear contrast. So let's get started. Over here we have a graph representing four different group means from an experiment with four different groups, A, B, C, and D. Now I've set the grand mean here in the middle, and I'm saying that group A and B are a little lower, and group C and D are a little higher. Now if we thought each group um, did something different, and there's like different reasons why they have different numbers than the grand mean, then we'd be considering something like this top right-hand panel here that the differences from the grand mean, the, and I've drawn those with little arrows going up or down for, for each color. Um, you know, the group A goes, it's a little bit down off the group mean, group B's a little further. The idea is that each of these have independent contributions. They're unique contributions. They're unique reasons why the group mean is different from the grand mean. Now let's consider a set of orthogonal contrasts that represent these differences in a different way, not as a unique contribution of individual group means. And I have that represented right here with three linear contrasts, one, two, and three. Notice that group A and B, they're both a little low, and group C and D, they're both a little high. So we could think of the reasons why there's some deviations going below and go, some going above as being a little bit driven by this whole situation where A and B are basically the same. They both drive group means down below the grand mean. And C and D, they're both the same too, but they uh, that influence drives the group means up. For example, let's say A and B, that was Tylenol and acetaminophen, if I remember correctly, those are the same thing. So maybe this is the brand name, and this is just a regular old, the same thing under a different name. Maybe C and D, maybe that's Advil and ibuprofen. I think those are the same thing too, but maybe that's the brand name one, and just like a regular old knockoff. So it's possible that um, there's a general influence of acetaminophen. Both of these groups got acetaminophen, and that general influence causes the group means to go down. And both of these groups, they got the same drug too, ibuprofen, and that's causing both of the groups to go up. So the reality or the causal influences of what's in our manipulation or in our different groups might be different really from how we did the grouping and linear contrasts are an uh, alternative way of thinking about the grouping structure. That'd be one way to think about it. Now we can see that there's more to explain in terms of the differences in these group means. It's not that A and B are exactly the same, so there's a little difference there. So if we wanted to describe why these two means are down from the grand mean, we could say, yeah, it's a little bit of this influence, there's also something like this going on in our second contrast. That is, A is greater than B. So uh, A doesn't push the mean down as much as B does. A and B both push down, but A pushes down more. So we could describe these two group means as really the sum of this influence and this other influence. Same thing for group C and D. I drew a small difference between C and D. That's not captured here where the influence from um, this idea is pushing both of those 
group means up the same amount. And so it looks like there's yet another one that we're describing here with the third contrast that D pushes up more than C does. So one big point I want you to take away is that we can think of describing the deviations from the grand mean as four different unique influences, or we could think about them as combinations of groups of influences. The next thing I want to show you as we walk through in R uh, is to see how this top one is actually can be expressed in terms of three orthogonal linear contrasts. What I've got right here are three orthogonal linear contrasts. And uh, if you read the chapter from the textbook, uh, you should hopefully have an understanding about what those contrasts are and that we could even create different examples of three orthogonal linear contrasts. In a moment, we're going to see that we can have uh, this expressed that way. And we'll also talk about why there's three of them, even though we have four of these means that we're trying to explain. Okay, so let's get on with it. We're going to try to explain these four means from the perspective of the grand mean, and we're going to do it using this strategy right here. We'll do that first, then we'll do it using this other strategy. So let's get going. We've got our group means, and I just chose four, three, 10, and 11. That basically could be, this could be a four, a three, a 10, and 11, representing that basic pattern, all right? So what's the mean of that? Well. A seven. So if we were to think of this bar as having a seven, it's right in the middle of all those numbers. Okay, let's get the differences. So this is the deviations from each group mean and the grand mean. And we could square those differences and we could get the sum of squares, which is just adding them all up. We see that there's 50. So we, we see there's a grand mean of seven. And if we think about, well, just how much differences there are here, uh, using our summing of square strategy, we can sum it up and say there's a total of 50. 50 squared deviations f from the grand mean. All right, now before when we talked about the score model, we could think about what, you know, how do we describe this value for A? We called that a four. Well, we could say that's a seven minus a three, right? So it's a grand mean of seven minus a difference of three, that's the first number, um, get, that gets us to four. And we could think about that for each of these scores. Now, when we do that, we're using the grand mean in our formula. We're using the grand mean to estimate each of the group means. And when we do that in an estimation context, because we're using the grand mean, we're losing also a degrees of freedom here. So we've got four groups minus one group degrees of freedom leaves us with three degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna show you now how that concept is related to the concept of three orthogonal linear contrasts for this set of means. And if you noticed from the textbook, the number of independent linear contrast that you can have is the number of groups minus one. So it's the same as the degrees of freedom here. Let's press on. So what I've done is I've taken our data and I put it into a little data frame just like this, A, B, C, D for each of the group levels and 4, 3, 10, 11 for each of the group means. And I called the independent variable a factor. And if we remember from before, if we use the contrast function and put inside of it a factor, we can see what the current contrasts are. These are the default contrasts in R. So let's take a look at those. We got, um, here it is. Okay, so what does this mean? What are we looking at here? Let's step through this for each of the means, we're going to try to answer the question, how will we estimate this mean? And I'm going to tell you that the columns in this matrix, they tell us how we will use the group means and the grand mean together to estimate each individual mean. So how does it do that? Let's take a look at the contrasts for D. That's this. So 
if we just looked at this, that's this column right here, three zeros and a one. Um, so that's it, three zeros and a one. Now, what are we saying here? We're basically asking the question, um, when we think about the value for the group mean D, and if we go up just to look at what that value was to remind ourselves, that's the 11 here. We're going to say that we are going to say that the value of 11 is the grand mean plus a deviation. And that deviation is 100% com coming from what, uh, from the difference of, of, of the D group. This sounds a little ridiculous because I mean, where else would it come from? But we'll get to that in a moment. If you remember, we calculated the differences. This is the difference between the group mean and the grand mean for each group. Here's group D. It's four above seven, right? That's how you get to 11. If we did something like multiply the contrast weights, so we're saying by the differences, here's what we're saying. We're gonna add zero of the differences from A, zero of the differences from B, zero of the differences from C, and all of the differences from D. One times four, all of them. So it kind of looks like this. The formula for D is the grand mean, which is seven, plus one times the differences of group D. All right, now we can do the same thing for C and B. If we look at this contrast, we can start to see that, okay, how are we estimating C? Well, let's look down. Uh, we're using zero of A, zero of B, all of C, and zero of D. And for B, we're using zero of A, all of B, and zero of C and D. If I just do this, multiply this contrast matrix by the differences for each group, what we see here is, is this, let me see if I got this right. Okay, we're seeing that uh, we'll think of B as negative four different from the grand mean, we'll think of C as plus three different from the grand mean, and we'll think of D as plus four different from the grand mean. So if we're thinking about our kind of formula or the makeup of each group mean in re respect to the grand mean, we're gonna do something like this. First of all, I'm gonna take the contrast matrix and multiply it by the grand mean, which is seven. So we're saying this, the means for group B, C, and D, they're all seven from the perspective of the grand mean, and then we're gonna add in the differences. So we're gonna take the contrasts for uh, group B, C, and D, multiply them by the differences there, which are negative four, three, and four, so we get negative four, three, and four. And if we do all of this together, then we're basically just adding the grand mean and the difference for each group. And we got three, 10, and 11, which were the means for group B, C, and D. Now, remember, we've got four groups. We haven't got to A yet. Notice for A, there's no column for A. This has to do with degrees of freedom. Remember, we're defining each of the group means in terms of the grand mean. We've done that three times now. So there's no degrees of freedom left over for A. There is only one number that A can be. The grand mean is seven. We talked about how we got the numbers three, 10, and 11. Right, those are the means of B, C, and D. Now we could put any number for group A, like two or one, but if we did that, we're not going to get the mean to be the correct number. There's only one number we can have for group A that will give us a grand mean of seven, and that's a four. If we do a two, we get a, a wrong number. If we do a one, we get a wrong number. So the the mean for the last group here is forced to be a specific number. It, it could have, the last group could have been any of them, depending on how you want to do it. But R assumes, R just takes out the first group. All right, so the purpose of that little example was to see how we write a formula or use the grand mean to explain each of the four group means. And when we do that, we assume they're 
each group mean has four independent influences, but because we're estimating and when we kind of look underneath the hood of what all of this means, we see that uh, effectively we have uh, three linear contrasts that are orthogonal that tell us the contributions uh, of each group mean uh, to the formula that we use to relate the group means to the grand mean. So even, so even this way of thinking about the data, which is kind of like the default assumption here, um, is itself uh, an orthogonal linear contrast with uh, three contrasts. Now let's turn to a more complicated version of a linear contrast, sorry, a set of linear contrasts that are orthogonal. And let's see how we would implement each of these in R. Okay, what I'm gonna do is write down the contrasts one at a time. The first one was that group A and B were less than the group grand mean and group C and D were more than the grand mean. Also that A and B were equal and C and D were equal. So I can describe that in terms of two negative ones and two plus ones. The next linear contrast was that group A was slightly higher than group B. Uh, so there's A being greater than B. We can describe that basic pattern as a one for A and a negative one for B. Finally, there's the pattern that C was less than D. We can see that here, C less than D. So we could define that pattern right here. Let's go ahead and put all of those things into a matrix. We can call that my contrasts and it will look like this. So we've got our three contrasts and if we want it for fun, we can assign this contrast matrix to the contrast matrix for our independent variable that we're messing around with. So let's do that. Before this was three zeros on the top and then three zeros on the diagonal. And now when we do this, we can see we've replaced that one with our new contrast matrix. Now we can check that our vectors are orthogonal to verify that in fact these three contrasts are independent by putting them into the core function and it's going to compute the correlation between each of these and we can see that uh, in the diagonals sorry in the upper and lower triangle we have all zeros meaning that contrast one is not correlated with two or three two is not correlated with three and, and so on. All right, we're gonna do a couple things next. First of all, if you were to look at your textbook, you could see this formula right here that describes how to calculate the sums of squares for each contrast. And here's an example here where we have some means, we have a contrast, and then how to compute the sums of squares for that contrast up to an F value. We're going to do that in R in a moment. And the purpose of this will be to show that if we use this new set of three linear contrasts, uh, we will still add up to the same total sums of squares that we had with the first set of linear contrasts. And this is one property of orthogonal linear contrasts. They all explain the same amount of uh, variation. They're just different ways of splitting it up. And so let's take a look. I'm gonna take our contrasts right here and I'm gonna multiply them by the group means. Okay, so here's our group means. And if we do this, what we can see is for each contrast, uh, the outcome here. So th this is like in the formula taking this part and saying, let's multiply the contrast by the mean, right? Um, we're looking at now the, the, the mean multiplied by the contrast weight, and we're effectively looking at this column 
right here, but in but we're looking at three of these columns because we did this three times for each of the different contrasts. So the next thing we want to do is find the sums of these columns. That would be like in the textbook right here, getting this value. So we just got that three times, 14, one, and one. Now we're going to square those sums. So we get a 196, one, and a one. Now the other part of the formula is to divide by the sum of the squared contrast weights. Okay, so we have to take the contrast matrix right here, and we have to square these values. And then we have to add them up. So we got a four, two, and a two. So basically what I wanna do is I wanna go back up here and divide 196 by four, one by two, and one by two. And that's what this line does right here. Notice that if I add all of these things up, we get to 50. And if we go right back to the top of this example, you will see that the sum of squares that we found here equaled 50. So if I just rerun this and we look back down at all our numbers, so we have a, a 50 here. If we express the sum of the squared deviations between the group means and the gram means, we get a 50. All right, just getting back to this picture, you know, one thing that's interesting about these linear contrasts is you're taking different perspectives on the patterns inside your mean differences that are the biggest or assigned to sort of different group groups, grouping structures. Uh, and for each of these linear contrasts, you can compute an F value, giving you kind of a perspective on uh, how much of the total differences is caused by one or two of these patterns. So for example, if I was to look at this data and I can see there's a bunch of differences. These things are different. A and B are different from C and D. C is different from D. B is different from C. A is different from D. There's lots of differences everywhere. Now, what uh, is the best way to think about these differences? That's, you know, that's who's for me to say, really? Maybe it's like this. A is its own special difference. B is its own special difference. And so is C and D. They're all very different. And we need to think about them all very differently. Or you might say, well, you know what the biggest difference is that A and B are down and C and D are up. It's like this, this contrast right here. This is the basic thing that's going on. And yeah, if you were to probably do an analysis, you would find that the F value here is pretty big because this is the this kind of difference pattern is the biggest pattern of differences in the data. This is a pattern that's necessary to explain this data, but you know this might not be the the, the biggest, uh, most obvious kind of pattern in the data. All right, this is very much a supplement intended to complement the book chapters on these concepts. The book chapters are very well written and much better produced than these YouTube videos, so I highly recommend reading those and digesting them. Uh, Okay, so I got to think of some next things to do for this lab and I'll I'll be back with more videos.